Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of Brute Facts. Got a special guest tonight, one whose work I have thoroughly enjoyed. Um, a lot of you ethicists out there will uh, know exactly who he is. Uh, we have Russ Schaefer Landau, Dr. Russ Schaefer Landau. He has a PhD from the University of Arizona. He's a professor at uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. He's had several books that have made a huge impact. Uh, he has the moral realism, uh, a defense, whatever happened to God and evil, which is more of a layman and student kind of book on morality. And he is the founder and organizer of Madison Metaethics uh, Workshop that he holds annually. So stick around and we'll bring Dr. Schaefer Lindo on. Hello, Dr. Schaefer Landau. I've been instructed to call Russ. How are you doing? I'm just fine, thanks. How about you? I am doing fantastic. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, so why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, uh, what you specialize in, if they don't already know? Yeah, so I'm a philosophy professor. I've been at the University of Madison, uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison for about 20 years with a little stint at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, where I was the director of the Ethics Center down there for a couple of years. Um, I've been thinking about ethics, moral philosophy for my whole career, really, which has been a long one. <laughs> I'm almost 60. Uh, and I am most interested in that area of uh, moral philosophy called metaethics, where we think about what the status of morality is, whether it's all made up or whether there's some kind of objective foundation, if so, what it is, uh, how we can come to know moral truths, if we, if we can, what kind of rational authority they might have over us, questions like that. That's, that's me. Sweet. 60, man, and you still got way more hair than I've had in a long time. That's just so unfair. And you got a beard. Well, my beard's a lot grayer than yours. That's it. Hey, it's uh it's getting there. It's you know, it's he's just catching up with me. So <laughs> luckily I hide most of it underneath. But uh so um so a lot of people were wondering, uh, as I asked you before, you're you're an atheist, right? I am, yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. And uh as I was talking to you, I, you know, told you how much I kind of respected the fact that that was a very hard question to find because, you know, especially certain areas like ethics, uh, you know, there tends to be more talk about religion or non-religion than the actual ethical frameworks themselves. Yeah, I take it in, in, uh, the classes I teach and the books I write, I, uh, at least the textbooks I write. I try not to tip my hand and that's, that's not difficult for me actually, because I think that even if you are a theist, you shouldn't believe that uh, God say so makes things right or wrong. Uh, and, and that I've, I've got a lot of good company among my uh, theist friends. Uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely be in that camp, um, especially with divine command theory. That's, just a hard one to, you know, bite the bullet on one of the horns. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you grow up religious or 
I did. I didn't really. I mean, I uh, I grew up sort of cultural Jew. I got bar mitzvahed. I, I went to Hebrew school, but um, the uh, there was not a lot of emphasis in the home or in Hebrew right. school for that matter. Right. In doctrinal matters, I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't brought up thinking that uh, the explanation for things that happen, good or bad, is is divine at all. And I never, you know, I just never, I never picked up you know, a belief or even an acceptance in, in the existence of an interventionist God. And I didn't see any uh, justification for believing in a non-interventionist one. So here I am. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, um, either you believe there is or you believe there isn't, uh, you know, it's kind well, of. Well, yeah, you could, you could hang out in the middle and suspend belief but yeah. i don't even do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's even worse yeah <laughs> so what got you into philosophy in general well uh i guess i was a kind of brooding teenager and that coincided with a very fortuitous thing in my life which uh i had i could not have predicted when I was 14 or 15. I don't remember now. I, I grew up in outside Philadelphia, but I went, I spent the summer working as a prep cook in this hotel in, uh, in Western Massachusetts. And the head chef in the hotel was a Flossie grad student. And he, I don't know why, but he, he saw something in me, even though I was you know half his age. And he, uh, he sort of took me under his wing and gave me some some philosophy. He, he would talk to me about philosophical issues, and he gave me some uh, he gave me some Freud, some Nietzsche, some Camus to read. And I was I had never yeah. You know, just everybody who's had an experience with philosophy, just think about the first time. It's uh, it could it can be mind numbing people but for me it was kind of explosive and i i'd never been exposed to anything like this before and i i found it very interesting and so uh i i read philosophy on my own we, we didn't have a philosophy course or anything like that in high school i grew up in um and then i went to college thinking i wanted to be a philosophy major so i, I took a course my first semester uh, in philosophy and ethics, actually, and I, I hated it, <laughs> so, unfortunately. So I, uh, so I sort of dropped out of philosophy for a while. I even dropped out of college for a year because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with myself and my studies. And then during that year off, I, I rediscovered philosophy again. And then when I came back to college, I was really fortunate to find two amazing, brilliant professors, Martha Nussbaum and Rod Chisholm. And I sort of, I didn't sort of, I just let myself be taught by them. Uh, they're so inspiring. And I found a real passion for philosophy. So, and then I just haven't, I haven't looked back. Yeah. You kind of, it seems like uh story after story is real similar. It's like, philosophy has these tentacles that kind of just reach out and <laughs> grab people and absorb them it's uh most I, people can slip away with ease but yeah. Can't. <laughs> yeah that that's right i i remember what really grabbed a hold of me because you know when i was younger if you'd ask me about philosophy i'd be like how worthless you know and somebody was giving me the brain in a vat argument. And I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You know? <laughs> and I start, started pondering it later. And I was like, wait a minute. How do I know I'm not a brain in a vat? How do I, you know? So I was kind of just enthralled from that point about wanting to know, you know, the deeper things. Yeah. Um, and so, did, so you just kind of stumbled into ethics. It, wasn't really something that well it was um i didn't take any other ethics i mean i took some uh, a couple classes in uh, ancient ethics with martha nussbaum but other than that i didn't take any ethics classes as an undergrad and uh it wasn't until i went to grad school 
that I took some uh, just straight up ethics courses. Well, I went to college just wanting to learn the meaning of life. And I figured the philosophy department would be the place where I would learn that. And it turns out it, it, it wasn't. Um, I'm still, I'm still thinking about that, those issues and trying to figure, figure them out. But I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I decided there are probably other, other young people like I was when I was a younger person who, who want to think about this sort of uh, seriously. And so I put together a meaning of life course that I have taught intermittently over the last decade, just for people, you know, for people like my younger self. And hopefully it addresses some of their questions and, and gives them a basis for thinking about things on their own. Yeah. So it, was there anything specific that uh, geared you more towards meta ethics than normative ethics? Is it just a place you found that you uh, that needed more work or? Well, I don't know that that uh, philosophy needs my work at all. <laughs> so yeah. I never thought of myself as like on a mission. I'm going to, you know, I, this, this field needs me. It's that I just couldn't do without it. it you know, I never, I never thought until my last year of grad school, that I'd actually be a professor. Um, that wasn't on my radar screen. Really. I just didn't, I didn't, I looked at my undergraduate mentors. I looked at the my graduate school mentors, and I thought, you know, I'll never be as smart and as talented as them. And it turns out that's that's right. I I am not. But I found I made peace with that yeah. <laughs> and thought, well, you know, I could still have a fulfilling life and career by by working in, you know, doing what I can, you know, the best I can, and and um these areas. What is it that drew me to meta ethics? I'm not actually sure to tell you the truth. Um, I just have, have long thought that, you know, we don't make it up. We don't, we don't get the final say that I don't individually, I recognized my fallibility. Uh, and I recognize that groups can be fallible too, no matter how big the group. So I always thought, well, there's got, if something's morally right, there's some reason to, to do it. You know, maybe not always overriding most powerful reason, but some reason to do it. And if that's so, then morality cannot, has got to be something more than conventional morality. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, what is it? Uh, and I don't know. I just, you know, different people get totally fascinated by different questions. And I'm not, I, I can't explain exactly why it is that the that the meta ethical questions grabbed me in the way they did, but they but they did. Uh, and in grad school, I took a few courses in meta. I took all the courses I could in meta ethics. There was only one person there, Ron Milo, a great uh, a great teacher, very humble man, who taught those classes. And then I did a dissertation in that and in you know, basically objectivity in ethics and in the law. And uh, my interest in philosophy of law sort of waned a few years out of grad school, but the interest in meta ethics ha has never done. So, real quick, if you don't mind, um, for the audience, the distinction between meta ethics and normative ethics. Sure thing. Yeah. Um, so, normative ethics asks about the content of the standards the, of moral standards of the standards of right and wrong and of goodness and badness and virtue and vice. And ideally, uh, if you make discoveries in normative ethics, what you're doing is you're identifying truths about what's right or good or um, virtuous uh, and not just enumerating things that are good or right or virtuous, but it, helping to explain why by invoking principles like the golden rule, for instance. Um, and uh, I, you know, my own view is that the golden rule is not the ultimate principle about that governs right actions, but a lot of people th think that it is. And, you know, there are a lot of intramural disputes among normative ethicists about that matter. What meta ethics does is it says that whatever it is that is you know, the fundamental or the basic principle or principles of virtue, goodness, uh, right action, 
um, let's zoom out and ask what what are the status of those principles rather than asking what is the content of those principles are those principles just made up and if so in what way particularly can we know these principles and and any truths that follow from them and if so how can we know so it's asking more about the status of moral claims and, and moral truths if there are any moral truths at all rather than trying to discern the content of what's right and wrong or good or bad. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, and in that you have a unique position, um, as a non theist, moral realist and non natural naturalistic moral realist. So, yeah, it's not unique, but there aren't a a million of us either. (laughs) Oh yeah. That's, (laughs) Uh, would so I was wondering myself, would that be a kind of more Platonism or? Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, there are lots of different isms in philosophy, and I'm not sure exactly what you mean by Platonism. Um, if you know, if it's a if it's a commitment to this idea, if it's just a commitment to this idea that there are moral truths not of our own making that are uh, determined in some way by their essential nature uh, or the essential nature of um, the properties that feature in these claims, like the property of goodness or the property of rightness. By property, I just mean a feature. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Then, yes, then I'm a Platonist. And if by the non-naturalism bit, that's another ism you you tossed out, um, you mean that these truths, these moral truths, are not of the same type as the truths you'd find in the natural sciences. And if you also mean that the way we come to gain knowledge of these truths is not by, uh, is not at least exclusively by means of the ways we gain knowledge of scientific truths, then yep, I'm, I'm that kind of, I'm that kind of person. (laughs) Yeah. And I noticed on a uh, one of the things I admire about uh, the way you explain things is um, on the various uh, platforms that I've seen you on, you're very careful with defining what you mean by the isms, because as you said, in philosophy, there are lots of isms and what one person means eh, doesn't necessarily, you know, mean the other person has the same meaning. So, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, so with the moral Platonism, it was just more of um, that there are these objective facts that exist um, without necessarily some kind of grounding other than themselves is kind of where I felt or my understanding of it. It it just it's easier for me to kind of think think of things in you know, uh, a platonic sense or non-platonics and more materialist kind of view having that distinction between the two um but what is so what is most of the pushback that you would get oh there's (laughs) how much time do you have (laughs) (laughs) yeah i yeah i'll tell you when i wrote when i wrote this book moral realism a defense almost 20 years ago were probably three other people who thought the way I think sort of uh, they're non-naturalist moral realists. Now there are probably 13, maybe there are 23 of them. I don't know. Uh, it's still not, you know, as, uh, it's hardly the dominant view in, in the field, but there are more people at least who take it seriously. And in any event, there, it's not dismissed out of hand in the way that it, it was just, you know, a generation ago. So that's good. But there are a lot of ways to push back against a view like mine. Um, one way is to say that uh, that morality is – I mean, there. I guess there are three basic ways of pushing against a view like mine. One is to say morality is just a bunch of BS, basically. It's just it's just a fairy tale. It's a, it's a make-believe fiction. Um, there are good – you know, we can explain why people are – acting as and, and and talking and belie- and thinking as if things were really right and wrong uh you know 
it, it helps to coordinate social expectations. It helps to make people feel better about their lives. It, it helps to enforce social dominance of certain in groups as opposed to out groups. There are a whole bunch of you know sociological or and psychological psychological explanations. But at bottom, it's just a bun- it's just bunk. That's one way to push back. Uh, another way is to say no. Morality is legitimate, but it doesn't it doesn't uh, commit. To, it's not committed in any way to any objective truths or facts. Rather, morality is totally legitimate in the way that uh, other kinds of social artifacts, sets of norms that are social artifacts are legitimate, like laws or like uh, rules of etiquette. The, you know, they real, there, it really is the case that some acts are polite and impolite. Uh, but of course, you have to relativize these judgments to the social mores of of the, the you know of the society you're you're speaking about, and uh, on on that kind of view, there's no objective principles of the law or objective principles of etiquette, and morality on this view is just like that. Um, so legitimate, it's not bunk, but it's not objective either. And then the last kind of view is to say, yeah, morality is legitimate, but uh, you objectivists or you realists are, you know, barking up the wrong tree in that you think that what we're trying to do when we uh, use moral, uh, t- when we use moral language, when we think in moral terms, is we're trying to somehow describe the world or report a set of moral facts. That's not what's going on. What's going on is. We're expressing our emotions or our convictions of one kind or another, our not this our non-truth evaluable convictions. We're committing ourselves to plans of various kinds. What we're doing when we when we say, for instance, that genocide is immoral is not trying to describe genocide in any way, like saying of genocide that it's got this feature, this property of being immoral. Rather, what we're doing is we're expressing our opposition to it and trying to get other people to share our emotional opposition to it. On that kind of view, morality, it once once more, is totally above board, is totally legitimate, but there's no such thing really as uh, an objective world of, of, of moral facts and truths. It's just the world that science depicts and our emotion, more or less emotional responses to it that get conveyed in morality. So those are three basic ways of, of pushing back against a view like mine. And there are yet others, but I'm, I'm going to let you get a question in before that's I a, go and no, go I'm, and go. That's, and. that's fine. I, I'm learning from the teacher. So uh, it's a, uh, so on uh, your view, I, I agree with you in, in being a theist myself, like, you know, uh, I was talking about earlier is, even if I wasn't a theist, I'd still be a moral realist because it just, it, I'm not ready to bite the bullet, you know, that certain things just aren't truly wrong. Um, and so with it, I mean, uh, looking at your, the different interviews you had about that very same thing, it seems to be kind of what compels you to hold to a realist position, having to kind of bite these bullets of, uh, arbitrariness for, you know, the, these moral things that we think exist. Yeah. So I, uh, that is one, that's one of the elements that I find very attractive about the view that I hold. Of course I would, it's the view I hold. Right. But that is one of the elements that, that keeps drawing me back there. Um, this objective, we could call it an objectivist element, according to which there are, uh, correct moral claims and their correctness doesn't depend in any way on the attitudes that I or others have towards any of the elements of those claims. Um, now, you know, other, other kinds of views that I describe try to, ca- you know, they, they sometimes try to capture that objective element. So you might have a view according to which say, this is a so-called ideal observer view according to which, Moral, moral claims are true just in case they'd be in some way endorsed or they reflect the endorsements of uh, beings who are really souped up uh, intellectually. 
you know, they know all the relevant non-moral facts. They're completely rational. They're dispassionate. And you just take the responses of those folks. I mean, nobody is really like that, but those hypothetical, you know, you take the actual responses of those hypothetical individuals and they are the, they are, those responses are the things that explain why it's wrong to kill. It's because someone who's super souped up like that would oppose killing. And um, even on that kind of view, which promises a very robust kind of objectivity for ethics, I, I think there are problems with that kind of view. And so it pushes me to go all the way <laughs> and to say, yeah, you know, ethics is objective. Uh, none of us gets to make it up, not even the hypothetical beings who are super, super smart and completely rational. Even, you know, maybe they can't make a mistake, but that's not because their responses are determinative or, or, or the ground of or that in virtue of which moral claims are true. It's rather if they really are super ideal, all that means is that they can perfectly track a reality, a moral reality, not of their own making. And, and, and that's the view I take it. You, I mean, you've said that you reject a divine command theory. So I don't know if this is presumptuous of me, but it sounds like that's the view you take about God's attitude towards morality, namely God's an infallible recorder of a reality that's not of God's own making. Maybe you don't have that kind of view. I just made the inference on the basis of your rejection. Of yeah, it, I'm not ready to bite the bullet and say, you know, there is this thing that exists, um, you know, outside the, you know, nature, whatever one means by nature of God in some kind of way. Um, but I do think that as rational agents, uh, I think that we can explain we don't have to posit God for, you know, a lot of the objective things that we find in the world. I know a lot of people want some kind of metaphysical grounding, you know, for a lot of the mm -hmm. things that um, that, you know, kind of underlie the existence of different ideas. And at this point, I, I'm, I'm just not 100 percent soul. I haven't heard a, you know, an uh, meta ethical framework. Um, that involves God that doesn't seem to have, you know, glaring issues in it. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of still up in the air a bit about exactly where I stand on it. Well, that's a very sensible place to be in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have I have people, come to people love think the... people who aren't up in the air about a lot of things. Yeah, I, are either come total to... geniuses. <laughs> They're grossly overestimating their candle power. <laughs> exactly. I've come to learn that agnostic is a very good word in philosophy. <laughs> just, you know, um, I haven't worked it all out. I'm just kind of hanging out in the middle right now, trying to figure it out. Okay. Uh, so I've noticed that there seems to be a wave of moral subjectivists. Um, I don't know. Is that something that you've noticed in academia? Is there... Well, I've noticed it in uh, academia. Yes, I have not noticed it in uh, in philosophy. Uh, the The philosophical worlds that I inhabit, which is largely so called analytic or Anglo American philosophy, I mean, so I say so called because these divisions are so blurry, and it's you know it's just not clear what people mean by analytic philosophy. To me, it's just philosophy. It's written really clearly. Yes. Uh, that, that's all. And so if you're, you know, if you're su studying Hegel and Fichte and you're writing really clearly, that's analytic philosophy. Yeah. And so I don't really put much stock. In other words, I don't put much stock <laughs> in, yeah. in these kinds of terms, but um in the, in the stuff that I read and the people I talk to, I mean, there, there is a view that's taken, there are two views that are taken very seriously uh, that, that you might call subjectivist in some sense. One is, is the first view I canvassed earlier, the one that says morality is just all bunk. I, 
in some sense, it's subjectivist because what it says is that it's it's individuals are just making this all up. That's the sense in which it's subjectivist. Um, but you know, like I said, subjectivism, subjectivism, like so many other isms, can be used in at least a dozen different ways. So there's there's another kind of view whose proponents would not call themselves subjectivists, but under one description, at least, it sounds kind of, it seems kind of subjectivist, and that's the view according to which uh, all we're all we're doing uh, when we use moral language is expressing our own uh, emotions or plans or intentions in some way or other, uh, and we're not trying to represent some objective set of moral facts out there. And that's a view that's taken uh, very seriously by a number of really smart philosophers, as is the first view, which is the first view is what's come to be known as an error theory about morality, where we're all, where most of us are trying to state the truth. We, you know, we take the truth to be objective, uh, but we invariably fail because there is no objective truth in morality. Um, and the other one is, uh, the one I, the other one I spoke about, is sometimes called non-cognitivism or expressivism. I'm, I guess, I'm loath to be the one to toss out yet more isms in just a <laughs> half an hour of conversation. So, if you don't like to keep track of the isms, just forget about it. That's a, <laughs> you know, it's funny when you were uh, mentioning the, well, it's it's just all bonk. The first thing that came to mind was uh, error theorist. Uh, yeah. I have a couple of friends that are error theorists and we kind of go back and forth, you know, it's, uh, the just anti-realist, you know, there's just not any truth of the matter. It's, and uh, I just, I have such a hard time wrapping my head around anti-realism, especially uh, it, it, at least in this sense, uh, it, it just going as far as to say we're, we're in error to think that, you know, there's, uh, moral truths or things when it, it, I know this is kind of a cuss word in philosophy, but you know, with intuition, it just, I intuitively don't see how that position holds up. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a fan of intuition. So, you, you know, so we can talk about it till the cows come home and I'm going to be totally fine. Um, but I know other people are not, but in, in any event, I think, you know, what your error theorist friends are are maybe thinking is this that you know morality pretends to have some kind of authority over us in fact that's kind of baked in to the very idea the thought is morality unlike the, say the norms of etiquette is supposed to be authoritative you know when it comes to etiquette if you've got somebody who says oh, you know etiquette schmetiquette i I'll take it or leave it. You know, do I really need to set the fork on the left side of my plates? Big, you know, no. And I don't care. Um, we don't think necessarily that there's anything wrong with a person like that. They certainly, certainly don't seem necessarily irrational, uh, even if it's, you know, in a very, very mild way, impolite. If someone, you know, to take perhaps a better example, suppose someone starts talking to you with a mouthful of food, we could say, yeah, that's impolite, and they say, you know what? I agree, but big deal. I just don't care. And a person might be a bit of an a bit of an ass, <laughs> but you know, they but they they needn't be irrational. And and we can, in the cooler moments, recognize, you know, maybe there isn't anything other than just a kind of social coordination, the solution to a social coordination problem when it comes to many many rules of etiquette, but. People have people tend to have a different view about morality. If someone says, "You know what? I just don't care whether it's right or wrong to uh, to you know not to pay my taxes, not to pay my not to do my fair share uh, in cooperative undertakings, or to keep my hands off people whose looks I don't like," we think you know actually there's something seriously wrong about that person. We don't we don't want to. We're not inclined to just shrug things off in our assessments in the way we might do when it comes to people who break the rules of etiquette. 
So th that's all by way of trying to say there does seem to be something especially authoritative about morality. And error theorists pick up on that. What they say is, yeah, there's purportedly something authoritative, but we can't make sense of that authority. And sometimes the authority is meant to be just um, ca captured by the objectivity of morality, and they just cannot see how could it ethics be objective? How could it be that no one authored the rules of, of morality. I just don't get that. Uh, other, but and sometimes the same people, but, uh, but in some cases different people, level a different objection. It's related, but it's different. And that is ethics is supposed to be in some way rationally authoritative, such that if you act contrary to what's right and wrong, you're acting contrary to reason, or at least a really good reason. But how can that be? These people... These people have the following kind of view about reasons, namely reasons are all based in what we care about, what we want. So if you've got somebody who just doesn't care about doing being polite, then they don't have a reason to be polite and they don't care about anything that politeness can get them. Then they don't have a reason to be polite. Ditto for morality. If you don't care about doing what's right and wrong and you don't care about suffering any kind of ostracism, or negative criticism for ignoring morality, then you are not being irrational. You're not acting contrary to reason because all our reasons come from what we want. And yet, and here's the last bit, and I'll hand it back to you. And yet, those, those people who believe in morality are committed to this idea that there is some kind of special reason-giving force to morality such that no matter what you want, there's still reason for you to do the right, the morally right thing. And these erotheers just scratch their head and say, I don't get that. I cannot make sense of that. And therefore, since there's this authoritative element just baked right into morality, and since there isn't any such authoritative element, really, then morality is just founded on an error. The whole edifice collapses. It's built on sand, this kind of authority that doesn't really exist. Hmm. So what kind of role does intuition play in an error theorist? Well, for error theorists, uh, they would very likely poo-poo intuition. And what they'd say is, look, you folks on the other side, you realists, you're in the grip of a false ideology that is founded on unreliable intuitions. You realists, like you, Eddie, and me, Russ, uh, you, you, you start your thinking off by, be, by having an intuition, being struck in a way, in, intellectually struck uh, by an impression that some things are wrong and perhaps just wrong simply. Not wrong because I disapprove of them. I disapprove of them because they're wrong and, you know, independently of my attitude. And they're wrong in the, you know, even if my society came to believe all of a sudden that uh, not all of a sudden that uh, that's well, that some kind, even if everyone in society but me came to think, you know what, some form of very strong racism is actually morally called for, they'd still be wrong, and you know, there'd be little old me in the wilderness. Not that I'm some kind of moral paragon, I'm, I'm just trying to draw the point that even group unanimity is not enough to make it the case that the object of their consensus is right, morally right. They could be mistaken about that. And those of, those of us on our side, as your, your side, my side, Eddie, what we often do is we rely on intuition to support our convictions that some things really are right, some things are really wrong. And then the erotheist comes along and says, you know what? I can debunk those intuitions. I can explain where they came from without having to Assume that your intuitions are correct. You just have these really strong intellectual impressions that um, some things are right and some things are wrong because of the way your parents raised you or because of what you see in the media or because of the friends you hang out with or the things you read. And so your intuitions are not really credible. You know, they're not credible. Just imagine that you were living, you know, 500 years ago. 
in some society that condones slavery. You really think you'd have the intuitions you do now? So goes the argument. No, you wouldn't. And what that shows is that intuitions are just variable and they reflect the circumstances in which they were formed. Different circumstances, different intuitions. Don't trust your intuitions to give you any insight into any kind of objective moral reality. There isn't any. Right. That's, uh, how's, how's that? Am I doing pretty pretty well for the air theorist? Fan, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> That's, uh, I feel like I'm arguing with my friend now. Uh, <laughs> of course, I give him the old jab and trope. Um, you know, you may be uh, an air theorist, but you don't live like one. Uh, well, okay, Eddie. I don't think that's fair. I mean, I, I don't know. Know what friend <laughs> is, but you know what? An error theorists. The, I you know I know most of the error theorists who are professional philosophers in the world, <laughs> and to a one, they're good. They're, they're good people. Now, of course, they would. They would. They might say, "Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty good, but I'm not morally good." I mean, I don't go out and hurt people and stuff like that, but I don't think that earns me or anyone else, really, uh, the description of being morally good or virtuous. I'm just, you know, I don't want to hurt people. I do want to be, you know, on good terms with other people. So I keep my promises. I don't lie to them. I don't smack them around. But that's not because it would be wrong to do, morally wrong to do these things. It's because... Uh, it would be counterproductive to what I'm, you know, what I'm interested in getting out of life. So yeah. you can be an error theorist and a good, as a matter of fact, a very good person and be totally consistent. Okay. Yeah, let me let me clarify. I, <laughs> I might have uh, just skimmed through that one too quick. No, what I mean is uh, not, you know, their personal behavior uh, and morality but how they view a lot of things from an objective nature, yet they deny, you know, the kind of objectivity is. Uh, and, and it's just an old apologist uh, trope. It's, you know, it's uh, uh, it's not one that that I care about myself. I it's just to jazz them up and get them started. But, yeah, I'm, <laughs> it, it's uh yeah. So, you know, kind of like the ones who say, well, well, if you don't believe in God, then you know what's moral and what's not. And it's like, well, either it's objective or it's not whether God exists, you know, so we can all have morality uh, and, you know, we can do good things. We're just when you talk about God, you're you're going to metaphysics. You're trying to find a way to explain the objectivity. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, and that's one that really gets me a lot is how people think that you have to actually have a belief in a God to be moral. That makes no sense whatsoever. It almost shoots the person in the foot if they wanted to go any further, you know, with the moral framework that they have. Uh, so you're preaching you, converted here, Eddie, as you probably know. Anyway. <laughs> You're preaching to the converted, at least when yeah, you're <laughs> on that point. Yeah. Oh, oh, I have a, I have a uh, couple of uh, anti-realists in the audience, and uh, so it's, uh, it, it's all fun and jabs. It's, you know, at the end of the day, we we all just try to make the best sense out of the reality that we experience, and I think it's a lot less. My view is right, and yours is wrong. As this what's this is what makes sense to me. That's what makes sense to you. You know, mm -hmm. so back to the intuition thing. Uh, that's why I think intuition is so powerful, because after e even if you're empirically minded, at some point, it's just going to seem to you that something is true. That's your intuition. It's uh, and the way people deny it. Yeah, it's fallible. But we got to have some kind of starting point or end point or we're just going to keep going in circles. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, as a general methodological matter, I'm inclined to give credence to the deliverances of our intuition. Uh, they are fallible, as you as you just said, but uh, so are our perceptions, right? Per you know, perception is fallible, but nevertheless, it seems like a good starting point for a lot of uh, for the formation of a lot of our beliefs, and so too with intuition. And just like just as with perception, if you want to say no, someone says, you know, that, you know, that tablecloth is red. And the other person says, no, it's not. 
Well, and then, then the first person says, well, look, I, look, I got my eyes open. I can, I can see it. Then um, it's incumbent on the second person to give some kind of story about why it is that the conditions under which that perception were formed aren't actually truth conducive. And I think the same thing is, is, is the case when it comes to intuitions. Namely, you know, our intuitions are um, defeatable, overridable sources of justified belief. Um, they can't always be trusted, but if you are calling some intuitions into question, it's incumbent on you to say why they are to be suspect in a given case. And we can sometimes do that, of course, in just the same way that we, not, not in exactly the same way, but structurally, the, um, we can call into question some people's perceptual reports. You know, they don't, you know, I remember one time I was, I left the eye doctors and I had a pair of sunglasses on because I had eye drops in and things seemed slightly differently colored to me. And I didn't understand what was going on. It, was, it wasn't until someone pointed out the fact that I actually, this absent-minded professor, I had sunglasses on that were polarizing. And so I couldn't actually see colors for what they, you know, quote, normally. You know, that when it comes to our intuitions, especially our moral intuitions, People can say, you know what, um, that intuition, I know you're struck by it and you may feel very com confident, but I can tell you why uh, there's some grounds for suspicion. Perhaps it too comfortably serves your self-interest to believe it as, as you do. Or perhaps it's just very clear that you're just parroting some authority figure, maybe your parents or, or somebody else that you, uh, that you heard this very thing from that morning, you know, whatever it is. But – but I think that's that's the attitude we should take towards all of our sources of just, just justified belief. Namely, mm -hmm. none of them are infallible. Uh, right. But you know, there are many such sources. They can be trusted, uh, except when we, you know, when we've got a good, when we've got grounds for thinking that they shouldn't be in a given case. But to toss them out wholesale. Toss intuition out wholesale seems to me to be as problematic as tossing perception out wholesale. Right. Just because they're erroneous, maybe maybe more of our moral intuitions are inter erroneous than our perceptions are. I'm I'm willing to grant that actually, yeah. uh, but that doesn't mean that intuition should be tossed out whole cloth. And that that's a good thing with me being uh, epistemically a probabilist. I don't have to have certainty. I don't need certainty. I. If it's generally reliable and I can come to, you know, a, a decent probability that it seems true to me, I feel justified and I feel I can have knowledge about it. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't understand, you know, who, how people, uh, you know, argue against intuition and perception or fallibility of the senses. It's like it's an axiom, you know, it's axiomatic. We have to start with something, you know, how do you know the world, the real world exists? I have to assume it does. It seems like it does. I have no reason to question that it doesn't, you know, so it, it, it's fun. It, one thing I like about philosophy is, uh, or I don't, I have a love hate relationship is they question the obvious things. And it's like, Sometimes we just get stuck in this circle circle of trying to explain everything, you know, and it's, well, well, how do you justify that? Well, how do you justify that? Well, how, well, how do you justify that justification? And I'm just like, just stop. Just. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. People's tolerance for, for philosophizing. Yeah. Has different limits. You can't, you can't justify everything all at the same time. Right. Be, yeah, absolutely. Piecemeal. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for the hard questions now, uh, mm. what what kind of music do you listen to? <laughs> um, I listen to uh, a lot of classical music um, and I listen to uh, I used to listen to a lot of prog rock. I was actually in that year I, I after I dropped out of school took a year off of school. I was a drummer in a prog rock band. So I've, um, I listened to that. I, 
I don't listen to a lot of um, music that's that's made now. Uh, by now, I mean the last twenty years. <laughs> oh. um, but I do, uh, yeah. But I li- I listen to a lot of rock music and a lot of classical music, and um, some and uh, a lot of blues. Oh, I love blues. I'm I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee, and oh well, there uh, you go. Yeah, yeah. so you're all, yeah, you're all over that. Yeah, I miss miss going hanging out on Bell Street and just listening mm-hmm. to some homegrown blues. It's nothing like it live. It's uh, fantastic. So yeah, uh, so this tends to be one of the hardest ones that I get from philosophers. Who's your favorite philosopher, and do you have one? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I don't know that I've got a favorite. Whoop. I get you know, I got to be diplomatic here. I don't know if I've got a favorite philosopher. I've got um, I. A, most philosophy for me is really hard to read. Um, so you know, I, for pleasure, I read novels. Uh, and I've got a bunch of favorite novelists, but uh, philosophers. I in, I always enjoy reading Martha Nussbaum. Uh, my dissertation director Joel Feinberg is a delight to read. Um, among some of the younger folks who are writing now, uh, David Enoch has a, has a lovely style. He's very trenchant and and deep. I think uh, as a thinker, Mark Schroeder's Slaves Slaves of the Passions book was an amazing read. There's, you know, so many cool ideas per page. Um, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I wish you'd ask, prep me with this one so I could. <laughs> uh, Agnes Callard is someone who's really interesting to read. She's also one of these people who's got a, a ton of exciting ideas and who knows how to write really fluidly. Um, yeah, that's, that's a start. That's the reason I don't prep it is because that's one that, uh, I want to hear on the spot, uh, (laughs) you you know, being in, I'm not, uh, an academic in philosophy, but being in philosophy, you know, it's kind of a hobby and passion as long as I have, I couldn't name a single philosopher that I think is because there's so much that I think we can pull from so many different, you know, philosophers. I love to just kind of see, uh, rarely I I have had a couple just shoot one or two off the top and I'm like, wow, they must have Mm. a huge, uh, impact. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I think the person who's, who's got the most truths per page, (laughs) is uh, W.D. Ross in his book, The Right and the Good. Yeah, He's I haven't read that book. Stylist. Yeah. But you, you, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of truths going on in that book, I think. Awesome. I'm going to check that one out for sure. I've, I've heard yeah, about the book. It's a just, short book, so it's even better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's especially me. I'm very, <laughs> very ADHD. <It's, laughs> uh, so, yeah, when you earlier when you had mentioned the uh, – analytic philosophy and it was hilarious you know when we were comparing you kind of comparing that you brought up Hegel because it seems like anytime somebody talks about continental philosophy one of the first people that come up is Hegel and Mm -hmm. uh, so my wife was asking me the other night you know about the distinction between the two and it was very similar to your response (laughs) I told her I said if you can understand it it's analytic if you can't understand, <laughs> it's continental. Of, of course. <laughs> the thunderbolts yeah. from those who study Fichte and Schlegel oh. uh, are going to be raining down. Uh, but no, absolutely. Like said, yeah, let absolutely. a thousand flowers bloom. I just myself have, uh, you know, some, some philosophical texts are just require a whole lot more training to even be able to get in. And so if you open the, you know, if you open a book by Derek Parfit and you've got some, you know, some philosophical aptitude, you're going to be able to get a lot. 
if you open the book by Heidegger, you know, if you open Being in Time, uh, you're not going to get, I think, you're not going to be able to um, get a lot. You're going to need some training. You're going to yeah. you know, need people who are well acquainted with this tradition to be able to hold your hand. And there's nothing the matter with that. It's just a different yeah. way of doing things. It's, a, you know, it's, it's a different um, tradition. And where, where I say, I don't believe that these traditions are disjoint. You know, there's, there's substantial overlap, but nevertheless, you know, talking grossly at a very large level and probably uh, not probably, but a bit of a caricature, you know, if you can under, you know, if it's lucid right off the bat and clear, it's analytic. But like I said, that's a caricature. Yeah, so, it is. It's, I'm trying because to prevent, it, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, it, a lot of uh, analytic philosophers get a lot from the quote-unquote continental philosophers. And mm -hmm. it's uh, it's just a different level of abstractness that they kind of think on, you know. It's like I just attribute it to uh, them being far greater more, or far more intelligent than I am. And it's got to, well, I got to kind of build up to that level. So, uh, but yeah, there's always a bunch of people who are a lot more intelligent than you, no matter who you happen to be. Well, yeah, that's With, one of the things I, yeah. When you, you were talking <laughs> I'm about not one of them, <laughs> you're, you're too humble. Uh, that's, you kind of touched on it earlier. And that's my thing is the longer I spend in philosophy, the more I learn that I don't know. It's, yep. it's, it's like, you I think, hear you. You think you have a grasp on something and then you read somebody else and they're just like, just kind of blow yours away. And you're like, okay, well, I really didn't know much about that, that I thought I did. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it's, it, it's like a fractured glass. You can spend your entire career on one little crack in this mass, you know, in philosophy. And there's, you can get drugs so many different ways. It's, it's insane. So, yep. But I promise you, I'd keep you only an hour, and I am uh, extremely appreciative that you decided to come on with us. Happy to do it. All right. Uh, do you have any? I've got his uh, site description or link in description for you guys down below. Check out his books. Do you have anything that you're working on you wanted to mention or plug or? Uh, no plug. I mean, I am working on three books with a couple of collaborators. And I've been doing it for the last eight years. Well, um, my colleague at UW, John Bankson, and a, a colleague at the University of Vermont, Terrence Cuneo, we've, been, uh, we've got a book on philosophical methodology that's coming out with Oxford in a few months. We've got a book called The Moral Universe, which we are finishing up and, and hopefully will do in the next like three or four months. And that's a uh, defense of non-naturalist, moral realist, moral metaphysics. Uh, and then we've got a book called Grasping Morality, which we're about halfway through. And that likely won't be done for a couple of years where we try to, where we talk about uh, moral epistemology and, uh, and the nature of moral motivation. So we've been, that's basically been my, my big projects aside from some textbook work over the last many years, those have been my big research projects. And it's really fun to do them collaboratively with yeah. two super smart philosophers. Yeah. yeah. You're talking right up my alley, mixing uh, morals and epistemology because epistemology is kind of where I hang out the most. Uh, mm -hmm. And, but uh, yeah, I, man, I, I, I'm just so happy and stoked that you came on here and spent the time with us and, explained everything and let a, let us pick your brain a bit um we would you know uh, good luck on the stuff coming out i'm definitely going to check those Thanks. books out um and i'm going to let you have the rest of your night and i'm gonna see everybody else out of here uh if you want to hang out in the backstage i'll be there in a minute if not if you got to go that's fine sure. i'll talk to you later on thanks for having me on eddie All right, take it absolutely mm -hmm. There you go. Russ Schaefer Landau, man, I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed his work. I am super stoked um, that uh, he agreed to come on. 
for everybody that's here live on YouTube, we are uh, on every podcast platform and actually doing very well on the podcast platform. I'm just about at 2,000 downloads and gaining significantly each day. So for all of you that listen on the podcast, thank you so much for the downloads and for being here. Uh, I have two big guests coming up. I have Stephen Law and Greg Kokel from Stand to Reason. Uh, we will have Stephen uh, November 23rd and Greg Kokel December 1st, which is my birthday. So I'll get another year older and quite a few more uh, gray hairs. But thank you, everybody, for showing up. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And we will see you guys next time.